We often talk about tires being one of the most important parts of a mountain bike. In particular, the tire pressure that you run them at and the tire tread that your particular tires have because they can be instrumental in how your bike handles off-road. There can be a lot more to a set of tires than you might initially realize. Let's talk tire tech. At GMBN, we use Vittoria tires, but in this video, the technology I'm gonna be talking about is largely seen across various different tire manufacturers. So I will be name dropping different tires, models, compounds, and things like that where relevant. Uh, just for clarity in this video, I'm just gonna show you what I'm gonna be talking about here. So we've got the tire bead itself, you have the casing that joins the two sections of beading together. You have the tire tread, of course, that sits on the top. That's the bit that keeps you connected to the dirt. And then on the sidewall, you have all the information about the tire. Expect to see things like the model name, the sizing here, the ETRTO measurement, which we're gonna get into later in the video, and even things like the rubber compound that the tire uses. So first up, we can talk about the tire casing and the bead because fundamentally, this is the foundation of the tire. No matter how good the rubber is that you put onto a tire, if you don't get the basics right, it's simply not gonna handle well and you're gonna end up with an unreliable tire. Now first up, we're gonna look at the beading. Now the beading itself is what holds the tire onto the rim. This is really important for a tire to get right. Thankfully, most manufacturers seem to have this nailed these days but you do still get some different materials that do handle slightly differently. You get steel beading, which you used to see in downhill tires, and you sometimes still see on cheaper end tires. Nothing wrong with it, it's just a bit weighty. Higher end tires tend to have, like these ones here, Kevlar or Aramid beading on them. And you can also get some folding orientations. You might notice this one here is coiled up. This is a folding Kevlar bead there. Now you'll often hear things called TPI reference with tires. Now that TPI reference means threads per inch. Now quite simply, tires used to be manufactured from cotton thread back in the day. And in fact, some high-end road tires are still in fact made from cotton because they do offer a ride quality you can't get with other materials. But one of the downsides with cotton as a thread using in a tire is the durability. So later on, tires started moving into nylon thread and you tended to get 60 and 120 threads per inch on tires. Now in a road world, they go up to 320. And the reason for that is they're using much thinner threads on there, of course. They want a tire that's extremely lightweight and still manages to be quite sort of comfortable on the road. In a mountain bike world, 120 and 60 are the two common options. Most higher end tires tend to be 120 threads per inch, whereas downhill tires and cheaper tires tend to be 60. Now the reason for the 60, it doesn't mean that you're suddenly gonna see loads of holes in between those threads. They're just as closely packed. It's just the threads themselves are much thicker and much more durable. As a result, the tire's better for impact resistant sort of stuff like downhill racing against rocks and stuff like that. There's a downside to it because the fact there's less threads and the threads are much bigger, the tire's not gonna be as compliant off-road and you can suffer from a bit of a wooden feeling by comparison to the 120. That's all you need to know about TPI. Moving on from the TPI, we go into the tubeless ready part of tires. Now, because tires are actually, because of the construction, they're still threads at the end of the day, as referenced in the TPI, you have to make that sealed. Uh, it's quite simply, what makes a tubeless ready tire is a tire that's had a layer of latex, uh, an ammonia mix, there's various different materials depending on which tire is manufacturing them, that effectively seals in that inside of the tire there. So you could put a tubeless ready tire on a rim and inflate it, you don't need the sealant to make it tubeless compatible. It will hold air, although it's not recommended to keep it like that because you can still suffer punctures and it's not gonna stay up, basically. Tire ply is something else you're gonna hear referred to with the casing. You get single ply, which you typically see on much lighter tires, like cross-country tires. Uh, the reason for that, quite simply, is it's a lot lighter. Cross-country wheels are all about minimizing that rotational weight, so you need those tires. The downside of a single ply compared to a dual ply tire quite simply is the fact that it's far less puncture resistant. Now, if you look at a dual ply tire, they're much thicker. You see, this thing almost wants to stand up on its own. It's a very tough, thick tire. The downside to this, of course, they're gonna weigh more. So some manufacturers get around this by offering somewhere in the middle. You might hear of casings, for example, from Maxxis, they have their EXO, which is actually a single ply casing, but they put inserts in the sidewalls just to give you a little bit more protection 
but also retaining that light weight. You get the same effect with the Toyota tires. You've got single ply tires, you get the trail tires, which are also single ply and they've got sidewall protection. And then you get the big heavy Enduro tires, which are dual ply. Uh, you also see, as you can see on this particular tire here, they've got beautiful inserts in the actual sidewalls themselves. So they're incredibly resistant to burping, folding and wallowing. Uh, definitely something looked at and looked for by Enduro riders, downhill riders, and people like Blake really, the sort of riders that turn any turn into a 90 degree sort of thing. Um, that's what you want, the sort of support that you can get from a dual ply tire. You're certainly not gonna be caring about the weight if you ride like that. One thing that's particularly cool about the sidewall inserts is some of you might have suffered a pinch puncture right down by the beading itself. If you have, you'll know it's nearly impossible to fix. Even if you set your tires up tubeless and use one of those tubeless plugs that you force into the tire, it can just never really seal properly. So by having a beautiful insert in the sidewall of the tire, it means it's incredibly resistant to getting tears right down there by the bead. If you ride hard, really save yourself some money and at least spec a heavy duty like this on the rear of your bike, where you're likely to get that sort of damage. Okay, so let's talk about the tire size or the casing size. So you might hear about 2.3 inch tires, 2.5s, whatever. All that information is on the sidewall. Now when tire manufacturers produce the tires, they have to adhere to the European Rim and Tire Technical Organization or the ETRTO measurement. That is written here on the sidewall of the tire. So where you might judge the tire by seeing 2.3, like it says in this case here, the real measurement is actually written underneath that. This one is a 58, dash 622. That is the millimeter size. The 622 is simply referring to the fact it's a 29 inch wheel tire. The 622 of course is the outside measurement of that rim which is 24 and a half inch. By the time you put the big tire on it, factor that in on each side of the rim and you have a 29 inch wheel. Uh, yeah, shot car, a 29 inch wheel is actually 24 and a half inch. The millimeter measurement at the beginning here, 58 in millimeters, that is actually slightly under 2.3 they put the average size and what it actually correlates to on the tire. So if you want the true measurement of a tire, look at the millimeter sizing right there. Now there's also a fairly new thing called the global measuring system that some tire manufacturers are choosing to use as well. So in addition to the measurements you see on the sidewalls, this one here, I've got it, it says a 57. WTB, for example, are actually providing two measurements. They actually measure at the shoulder of the tire, which is quite often on aggressive tires wider than the actual biggest bit of the carcass. And they also quote the carcass. So it might be 57 and 60 with the 622, uh, just to give you a little bit more perspective there. So you might see that creeping in amongst a few other tire brands. Some tires are certainly a bit more aggressive than others. Now, what does rim width do to tire profile? Well, this one is fairly easy to describe actually. And in fact, uh, just to reference Stan's no tubes here, they've actually got a very cool illustration on their website showing exactly what happens if you run a tire, uh, basically the same size tire on three different rim sizes. Uh, in the middle, you've got the wide right is what they call it. Uh, on the right, you've got the bell and on the left, you've got the light bulb. So what they're referring to here is if I use this tire as an example, if you were to run this on a very narrow rim, you get a very round profile on the top. The shoulder tread of the tire is not gonna do its job properly because it wasn't designed for around a rim that's this big. Of course, that gives you that kind of light bulb, that bowel sort of shape. If you're running a tire on a sort of the correct size rim, you're gonna get the sort of profile the tire was intended to be to do its job. It's got like a good sharp edge, but it's also rounded enough to make the transition from the center tread towards that shoulder tread. And then again, if you run on a super wide rim, you're gonna square it off so much that you're actually gonna get a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde characteristic to the tire because there's no real transition from the flat center tread to the shoulder. You're basically just trying to corner straight onto an edge. So therefore it is quite important to factor in the rim width. Um, most tire sizes you'll have, they'll have a recommended rim width to go, well basically to correlate to those. That is quite important. Okay, so now let's look at the tread on a set of tires. The tread, of course, is essentially what keeps you rubber side down when you're riding. Now there's lots of different tire tread options out there to suit all different sorts of riding styles and all sorts of different riding conditions as well, as well as disciplines that you're gonna be riding within. You're not gonna to want to run like a semi-slick tire on a downhill bike, nor are you gonna to want to run a heavily spiked tire on a cross-country bike. They're very specific. Now you could go chopping and changing your tires all year round to suit different riding conditions, or you could pick a set of tires that works well for most conditions and learn basically how to ride that tire in all conditions. Uh, there's no right or wrong way and nor is there an ultimate tire. There are lots of different options out there. So let's break down the features 
with an entire tread so you can understand what you need to look for to pick the right tire. Okay, so first up, we're gonna look at the shoulder of the tire. So this is the outside edges of the tire. And in a similar fashion to snowboards and skis, this is what you wanna cut into that terrain, an edge, if you like. This is really important for traversing cambers and getting a good amount of grip when you corner. But the key to a good shoulder is the transition from the center tread to that shoulder. If the tire is too square, for example, there is, there is no transition. Basically, you're on the edge straight away. And if it's too round, then really it's not gonna work out that well because you're gonna have less of an edge to cut in. This is really important why a tire like this has got such a defined shoulder that you pick the correct width rim for it. If you go too wide, too square, too narrow, too round. Of course, some other tires that don't have quite so pronounced shoulders. Now this tire is a bit more of a rounded profile. It's actually a cross country tire and this one's called a Peyote. The idea behind this is the fact that it's rounded in general because you don't change direction in an aggressive way on a cross country bike. You kind of want to be smooth in all of your actions. So whilst it has got quite a good angled shoulder there, the transition to it is nice and relaxed. Now the central part of the tire really does alter the way a bike can handle off-road. This particular tire is a cross country tire and you can tell the fact it's designed to roll fast because it has a fairly central ridge running all the way down the tire. This is gonna be extremely fast rolling, but it does have a couple of downsides. Because of that central ridge, it's gonna suffer slightly in looser conditions when accelerating and the same under braking because of that constant contact patch with the ground. You get a very different sort of handling with a tire like this, for example, which is more paddle based. It is gonna roll a lot slower than one that has a central band, but it's gonna cut in a lot differently under both braking and acceleration. When looking at paddle design tires like this, Think of them as like a paddle steamer or even like a sand tire on a motocross bike. The whole point is it literally cuts in and propels you forwards. And the same thing under braking, it cuts in to slow you down. It's all about how the tire interacts with the ground. Now, despite the fact that this tire has a central ridge running down the middle, you might also notice that it's got a slight chevron style to that pattern. And the reason it's got a chevron style is when you're cornering, of course, it's very different the way you corner a tire like this. It gives a bit of an edge or a bit more of an edge than it would otherwise have. You've got to think that this is a very low stack height tire. It's a very fast rolling style tire. The knobs are very close together. So it's going to get phased with very technical terrain, but it's about keeping it predictable. A predictable tire is far better than a tire that's massively good in one situation and horrendous in another. Predictability is the king. The stack height of the actual nobbles on your tires as well also makes a significant difference. For example, on the right here, this tire is a motor. Uh, you might compare this to other similar tires on the market like Magic Mary or the Shorty, for example. It's very open and it's got very deep tread. Very similar to a lot of motocross tires. The whole idea is the tire can really cut in and give you good purchase on the ground. Accordingly, because of the fact the tire is quite high up on firm ground, it can squirm around quite a lot. Kind of like you could say like a 4x4 tyre compared to a low profile tyre on a sports car. Uh, the low profile equivalent would be something like this tyre. Everything here is a lot lower down, which means on hard terrain, it's not going to squirm around. You can really push it into things and the tyre is going to remain feeling very predictable. It's something to definitely factor in when you're buying your tyres, where you're going to use them, the conditions you're going to ride them in and how you're going to ride. Now, usually on mountain bike tires, you'll find they are directional, which means there'll be an orientation to the way the tire has to rotate. Uh, you see here on a sidewall, it's got a clear marking here with an arrow pointing forwards. That is to go with the rotation, i.e. I'm going forwards, the tire is gonna rotate that way. The reason for that, if you look at this tire pattern, you can actually break down what it's gonna do. It has a staircase on the forward side of these nobbles here. Um, you might see this in the form of a ramp on some other brown tires. The whole point is that style profile when you're moving forwards is basically it has less rolling resistance. But you also notice the back, show, the back side of the nobbles here is vertical. The reason for that is that's what's gonna cut in when you're braking. The whole point is to roll as fast forwards as you can go. And when you need it to brake and slow you down, it's gonna offer you that. Having that sort of edge on a low stack height tire is really important to your handling of it because it enables you to have massive grip for something that really doesn't have a lot of tread by all accounts. Sipes is something you're gonna see on a lot of aggressive tires and a lot more modern tires. This one in particular is covered in sipes. That is these three markings basically you're seeing on each of the lugs. And they have a very specific job to do. 
Now imagine a big lug like this one on the shoulder here. If this had no sights in it, it'd be quite a solid lump of rubber. It's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna sort of move basically around rocks and things like that. By putting the sights in it, all these little slices, you can tailor the way it actually sort of manipulates itself over rocks. And then by having progressive sipes, again, you can change the characteristics again. If you look at these central nobles here, for example, they've got three sipes on each one and they're progressive. I, the bigger one is at the rear towards me, the smaller one is to the front. Now you want this tire to cut, basically cut in and give you traction when rolling forwards, but you also want it to roll fast. So by having a smaller sipe further away from that leading edge, it enables it to roll faster and it gives you a proper edge to claw into that terrain. By having a bigger sipe at the rear of it on the trailing edge, that is the edge for braking. So that's basically gonna deform loads and give you loads of grip and stability under braking. It's really clever stuff. And if you actually look at a tire in detail, you can work out what those sipes are gonna do on cornering. Of course, you want those side nobles, you want them to deform, you want them to sort of move around on stuff because otherwise it's basically just gonna scratch around for grip. The whole point of the tire is it's malleable and deforms to the surface while still giving you that predictability. Sipes are very clever. If you're riding, for example, in loose conditions or mud, then you're gonna want some sort of open tread design. Now, a design like this is great. It's got very high stack height of the knobs, which means there's a lot to basically stick in and give you purchase on the ground. And there's a lot of gap around all of those. That means it's basically it's got loads of room to do its job. It also means it's not gonna hold onto that mud. If the knobs are real close together and you're riding in thick, sticky mud, it's gonna clog the tire up and it's become overcome. It's not gonna give you any more traction once it becomes a solid unit. The whole point of these is that they can always cut in. There's always something there. Because of how aggressive these tires are, they're actually favored by riders that wanna ride in lots of other conditions as well. I know, for example, Blake loves this tire. The downside with a tire like this that you might not consider even with thick heavy duty enduro casing on, is there's a lot of casing here that's exposed. Ideally, if you're riding somewhere, let's say the Mega Avalanche, you probably wouldn't want to run this tire because you want to maximize on the casing protection you have. This is going to be amazing in terms of grip and predictability, but all you need is one slice that's going to really ruin your day riding. You'd be much better off, for example, on what looks at a glance like a similar tire, except the nobbles are just that bit closer together. There's a lot more nobbles in the same sort of surface area you see here. So therefore, this is a much better choice to use in rockier terrain. It also means there's a lot more edges here. When you're riding rocky terrain, everything's moving around. You're gonna get a bit more of a predictable ride if you're riding with a tire like this. Now, rubber is the last piece of the puzzle, despite it being what the tire is actually made from, um, because of the fact there's lots of different compounds of rubber available. Now, rubber tire compounds are measured using the Shore Gerometer. Uh, you can get these little gerometer testers. I've used one before in a factory visit. This is actually a digital one that I had before that. It enables you to measure how firm the compound of the rubber is. Now, a higher number, like 60A, for example, is gonna be far more durable and it's gonna roll faster, but you can have less grip as a downside. And you get the complete opposite with a lower number, let's just say 42A. You're gonna get much more grip, much more sort of compliance of the rubber itself. It's gonna deform around obstacles, but as a result, it's gonna be much slower because of all extra grip, and it's actually gonna wear out faster as well. Now, back in the day, you used to buy tires by the rubber number. Uh, Maxxis, for example, you could buy them in 60A, you could buy them in 42A, you could buy them in 40A. You used to buy them in numbers, but unless you knew exactly what those were, it could be quite confusing. So most manufacturers now have settled on their own identification system. Uh, for example, Continental use black chili, Schwalbe use the Addix system, and I think they have four different models within that, ranging from fast um, to extremely grippy. Uh, Maxxis no longer use the actual durometer ratings in numbers. They instead refer to this as max grip or max terror or max speed. Now, everyone is different and they have their own different things available to you as a consumer. Vittoria are quite different though. They actually, as in addition to offering a single compound, uh, twin and triple compounds, they actually are the only manufacturer that can offer you a quadruple compound, so a 4C compound tire. They've got the only machine in the world that can extrude four compounds into a single tire. And with the testing they've done, they actually find the four compounds works best across most of their tires. So you might get a cross country tire that's got four compounds in it, and you might get the Enduro race tire. It won't necessarily be the same four compounds. Of course, on a cross country race tire, the shoulders might be slightly softer, the center tread might be slightly harder, but it's gonna be nothing compared to the Enduro tire. 
Now, if I take this uh, Shaw rubber durometer tester and I just basically test it out on the sidewall of this tire, uh, bearing in mind that these aren't going to be super accurate unless you use it on a block of rubber. It's quite difficult to do and get an accurate reading, but these side knobs here are quite big. So I'm going to do a measurement at the base and a measurement at the top, and it should have two different readings. Uh, so if I look down here, I'm getting about 56, 56 to 58. Uh, obviously, that's quite firm and quite supportive. And then if I take that and measure right at the top of the knob there, uh, 41 and a half. Yes, yeah, so about 42. So that's a very soft compound on the top, but much harder and more supportive underneath, just to give you an idea of how that works. And the last thing to reference as well, uh, you might have seen graphene written on the sidewall of these tires. Uh, graphene is a graphite derivative, and it's well, it's kind of like the wonder stuff, really. Now, I actually went to their factory and found out a bit about this stuff. So graphene is the thinnest known material to man. It's also the strongest and it's the most conductive material known to man. Uh, just to give you an idea of this, right? So a human hair is 0.070 of a millimeter. A strand of graphene is a million times thinner. A million times thinner than that. Can you imagine that? It's absolutely crazy. And so graphene is essentially used on a molecular level in Vittoria tires to fill in the gaps in the way that rubber is used. So if you think what that means is essentially you're gonna get some abrasion resistance because the material is stronger than steel. It's very, very tough and resistant. Uh, it's also gonna help resist them wearing down so far. So although soft compound rubber on the tops of tires you see tends to wear fast, the graphene actually counters that. There's also an added benefit that they didn't foresee though, is that graphene actually gives the, all of the tires very much enhanced performance in wet terrain. Um, pretty insane technology, that. Uh, well, there you go. There's quite a lot more to a set of tires than you might have thought. There's loads in the casing, there's loads in the rubber compound, the tread, the sipes, all that sort of stuff. Uh, in fact, one of the coolest things I've done on GMBN Tech was visiting a tire factory and actually seeing how they take the tire Basically, how they make the tires by taking the rubber straight from the tree and turning it into a finished tire. Um, honestly, fascinating stuff. Please check that video out if you haven't already. And um, thanks for hanging around. See you later, guys.